What's good with the YouTube? You already know Big Flocker with a convict's perspective, man. Smashing, dashing, I'm going to slide on through with that little bit of energy, man. What's cracking, people? So today, man, today's uh, title, as you can tell, man, we're going to be talking about the Mexican Mafia, uh, current trial that's going forth. Um, I guess a lawyer was assisting the organization for a long time, and an informant came forth and has been testifying um for the defense kind of an interesting uh, article man so i'm gonna go through it a little bit and give you a little bit of my perspective of it a ex sudanian gangster and mexican mafia associate who helped control los angeles jails from the inside testified monday that a lawyer provided a crucial bridge between members incarcerated in different prisons relaying messages about potential murder plots and other key business decisions luis hefty garcia 43 is a star prosecution witness against an indicted attorney named Gabriel Zendejas Chavez. Describing his two days on the stand, Chavez worked as a facilitator for the Mexican Mafia, used his status as an attorney to secure private access to members in the most restrictive prisons in the nation. He said Monday he hopes to shed a possible life sentence for attempted murder through his tes testimony, though he vowed to take responsibility for his, his past crimes including an uncharged attempted murder to which he confessed during cross-examination. I wasn't expecting you to have me exactly name the name, Garcia told Chavez's lawyer, Megan Blanco. But he added, now that I have a name, now that I've named a name of someone I've assaulted in the past, I'm willing to accept responsibility. Ooh wee. Garcia and Chavez were among 83 defendants charged in two indictments announced in May 2018 by the federal prosecutors as part of a years-long investigation dubbed Operation Dirty Thirds, which refers to a tax they say the mafia imposed on drug sales inside the jail. With his own plea agreement already in, Garcia could earn a reduction in his sentence through his work with prosecutors against Chavez. In testimony on Friday, the former top-breaking Sudanian gang member in the L.A. jail answered that a rat is a person who is doing what I'm doing now, cooperating with the government asked Assistant U.S. Attorney Gregory Bernstein. Yes, Garcia answered. The U.S. Attorney's Office for the Central District of California has pursued several high-profile prosecutions of the gang in recent years, including a 33-count, 31-defendant indictment announced in April against the Orange County's Mexican Mafia that's yet to see much court time. The occasional trials offer a rare look at the inner workings of one of the nation's most ruthless and controlling criminal enterprises, Founded in California state prisons in the 1960s with 140 current full-fledged members and a broad underworld of allies. Chavez's trial provides one of the rarest, though he is not the first lawyer to face accusations of helping the Mexican Mafia. An L.A. federal jury in 2012 convicted disbarred attorney Isaac Guillen of money laundering and racketeering charges for his work with the Mexican Mafia and his underlining 18th Street gang. He was sentenced to nearly seven years in prison. Chavez appears, appears to have taken over for Guillen, as prosecutors tell it, becoming a top-ranked facilitator just like Garcia. Bernstein described in his opening statement how Chavez helped smuggle drugs into the jail, hunted down informants, and obtained paperwork through his status as a licensed lawyer that aided the Mexican Mafia's decision, making regarding violence and his control of lucrative drug markets. Chavez also hosted Mexican Mafia meetings at his law office as well as his family's Mexican food restaurant. Prosecutors say, and members sometimes refer to him as La Corata, which in Spanish, for the tie. Chavez is also accused of helping manage what prosecutors described as an extortion plot against the Mongols Motorcycle Club that involved forcing the group to pay 100000 to be removed from the Mexican Mafia's kill on site list but required broad consensus from mem Mafia membership. G gangs such as Garcia's, Sureños, and the MS-13, pushed by now former President Donald Trump as a dire national security threat, answered to the Mexican Mafia, also known as La M. The group has strict rules in a chain of command that includes secretarial roles, which, with Garcia testifying he had numerous secretaries helping him from the outside when he was running the LA jails as, as an inmate with Mexican Mafia member Jose Fox Landa Rodriguez because there was a lot to do. Garcia said he often met with Chavez under the guise of an attorney-client meeting, and he testified that Chavez provided a fast way to communicate with members in the maximum security Pelican Bay State Prison in Northern California. 
as well as the highest security federal prison in the United States, ADX Florence in Colorado. Home to infamous modern day criminals such as drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the Una Bomber, the Supermax prison also houses Mexican Mafia members Francisco Puppet Martinez, and before he died in 2018, Chap Reynoso. Puppet and Chap's input, Garcia testified, was key to crucial Mexican Mafia governing decisions, such as who to eliminate from the group by means of murder. But the Supermax restrictions meant communication with some of these members is very difficult, if not impossible. Besides Chavez, do you have any means of communicating with the Mexican Mafia members in ADX, Colorado? Bernstein asked on Friday. No, Garcia answered. Guillen, the attorney convicted 10 years ago, also had used his privileges to travel to ADX Florence to pass messages with Martinez. In the custody of U.S. Marshals, but wearing a light-colored, long-sleeved colored collar shirt with eyeglasses, a shaved head, and a mustache, Garcia continued his testimony Monday, describing phone calls with Chavez and their discussions about contacting Champ at ADX Florence and other business. He never seemed at one point eagerly, eagerly asked Bernstein, you want me to finish? Before the prosecutor said he'd ask another question, Garcia said Chavez also communicated messages to he and Landa Rodriguez from influential mafia leaders in prison at Pelican Bay, including that two men who'd long controlled the Wilmington neighborhood of South LA felt a man known as Little Man, who had started collecting rent through extortion, was taking money from them. Chavez passed the message to Garcia and Landa Rodriguez that, he, that the men at Pelican Bay, one nicknamed Sleepy, wanted Little Man to slow his roll, Garcia testified. When we discuss these things, it's like if me and another person were discussing this cup of water here, Garcia testified, referencing a court-provided water cup. It's just a regular conversation. Garcia also spoke with Chavez about delaying trial in an attempted murder case because Garcia didn't want to leave for prison if convicted and give up his lucrative position running the jail, Landa Rodriguez. Excuse me, that's running the jail with Landa Rodriguez. He said Chavez was to help persuade the victim, an inmate named, nicknamed Chubbs, who Garcia had stabbed in 2013, to recant his identification of Garcia as his assailant. Garcia testified that while surveillance video clearly showed him stabbing the man, we were just going to try to make it difficult for the district attorney that was prosecuting me. I knew I wasn't going to get off that charge. The goal was to get me a better deal. Garcia was facing a potential life sentence for attempted murder over the stabbing when he told the Los Angeles District Attorney Office in early 2014 that he wanted to speak with the FBI. In the ensuing meeting, according to testimony, Garcia told agents of an attorney who was close with now deceased Mexican Mafia leader Richard Peanut Butter Reese and was helping him and Landon Rodriguez with key mafia business. Garcia also gave federal agents a collection of notes mentioning Chavez called kites in prison and jails that he and Landa Rodriguez had passed between their neighbors, neighboring cells and the most restrictive area of the Los Angeles County Men's Jail. FBI Special Agent Joseph Talamantes testified last week that investigators hadn't heard of Chavez until Garcia mentioned him. Prosecutors told jurors that Garcia is eligible for a reduced sentence if he testifies truthfully. A plea deal filed in December 2020 has him pleading guilty to a racketeering conspiracy charge that encompasses the attempted murder, but it does not appear that he has formally entered a plea. He testified Monday that he also pled guilty in 2014 to separate attempted murder and arson cases in L.A. County that could carry a life sentence, but eight years later, he still hasn't been sentenced. Jurors have seen several of the jail notes throughout Gar Garcia's testimony, including one in which Landa Rodriguez wrote, I know the lawyer is a legitimate and a friend. Garcia is expected to continue testifying into Tuesday. Blanco getting about 30 minutes of cross in before the hour-long lunch break at 12.30 p.m. on Monday. She pressed Garcia about his cadre of crimes and the leniency and sensing that he hopes to earn through his testimony. Who else did you try to kill, Blanco asked. There's been so many so far as names. I can't recall exactly the names, Garcia answered. You tried to kill people and you don't know their names, Blanco asked. It happens often in my lifestyle, in the life I've lived before. Garcia answered, I wouldn't be able to get into the position I was in had I not participated in these kind of acts. It's part of who the Mexican Mafia is. Blanco said in her opening statement last Wednesday that Chavez's popularity with the Mafia stemmed from the great lawyering he did for Reese, securing his release from a drug-related life sentence. Reese, also known as Chino, died in 2016. Now, this just came out recently that he's going to trial, man, but I did a little bit of research on this uh, case, man, and... Uh, there was also the testimony of a security specialist 
at the uh, Admax facility in uh, Florence, Colorado, an individual named, uh, I think, Jean Pierre Espino. <laughs> and the thing about that was, is what alarmed him was when they had four, when he was coming to visit four Mexican Mafia members and they seen them passing notes. And so what they did is uh, they went into the bathroom and he was the only one to use the bathroom that day was this attorney. And this attorney had dropped notes in the toilet but forgot to flush them. They actually pulled these notes out, man, and were able to get the... You know, this is a classic example of a normal case to where, you know, sometimes you think you're too smart and you're able to get away with things for so many years, man, and eventually it all catches up to you, man. And those are the risk of the game, man. You know, uh, the MA in general, you know, the fellas from down south have been able to orchestrate a very secretive uh, operation. You know what I'm saying? It's not really... You know, like they said in this case, they had so many people that got indicted on this case, right? And the only way they were able to find out anything about this attorney was based upon this one informant. You know, what I've been learning about, you know, the Sudanians in general and the regulars that they have is one thing that they don't tolerate within their group is gossiping. You know, um, a little bit different from my experiences up north. There's always a lot of gossip, a lot of people talking about this and that, man. But down south, it has a whole different element, man. And that's why this attorney was able to fly under the radar for so long, um, you know, and but at the end of the day, man, you know, the charges that they got him for, you know, conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin and so forth, man. This was a big case right here, man. This was more involved around what was going on in the county jail and the orders that were coming out to the streets, the orders that were going in there. There was directives that were coming in, such as. Uh, you know, nobody could sell dope when they came into the facility until the M.A. got rid of all their dope. And then the, the M.A. still wanted a third of whatever you brought in. Um, another thing that I heard was is that they were using fraudulent cards to make have communications. Um, they had a lot of influence out there in Pomona. You know, I've, I've, I've always heard that L.A. County Jail is almost considered like a, you know, when there's, you know, big homies from down south there as one of their most recognized, you know, headquarters. You know what I'm saying? That's what's been conveyed to me through someone I know. Um, you know, this case is going to be very interesting to see what they do with this attorney. Are they going to um, set an example? You know, the fellas from down south, man, the organization out there, they've been able to infiltrate a lot of things out there from programs to, you know, law enforcement all throughout. The, ever since they started getting involved in criminal activities in the 60s, man. So none of this surprises me. Um, just the federal government is getting smarter. They're finding different ways to... Uh, you know, f file charges, RICO acts, RICO enterprises, you know, whatever type of uh, charges they decide to file, man. And they've been going after certain hoods, certain areas, right? This one is based upon just the county jail. You know, then you'll have the Orange County one that just came out. Then you'll have another one that just came out, man. So there's a lot of stuff that's going down out there in Southern California, man. And all it takes is one individual to flip. And you see the, re you see the uh, uh, adverse effects it has on the group as a whole, man. You know, um, this is why that lifestyle, man, like we try to sit there and tell people over and over again, man, it's not it's not so much about the camaraderie that you have. You know, it's turned into more of a business orientated group now as far as these hoods. Back in the days, man, like don't get me wrong, every hood probably had their money makers, dudes that were getting their fetty on, right? But back in my time, man, we were more concerned about game banging, partying, and females. Now everybody's more concerned about who they're involved in, who they're aligned with. Um, the associations. So these organizations have been able to really have a, a strong uh, control mechanism over these groups now. And this is what you're seeing now, more and more indictments. Because they need someone to be out there to do their bidding. You know, whether it's the fellas from up north, down south, you know, the other factions throughout the United States. You know, there's going to be those that are going to be eager to be put in positions to conduct activities because they want that recognition that comes with it. They want their, those petty permissions that come with it, having that type of authority and jurisdiction and how people look at you, you know. Um, I don't know what, why this individual decided to flip at this time on this case, man, but it happens every day, man. You know, some people have different reasons. Some people feel abused. Some people are scared to do time. You know, it is what it is. It's part. Of, I hate to say it, man. It's just part of that lifestyle. It's going to happen no matter what. Same way it happens when you go to work and people start to fucking snivel and complain. The same way you go anywhere, people snivel and complain. When people feel mistreated or scared or boxed in, 
they're going to make choices that are only in their best interest, you know, and that's just the reality of it, man. So those youngsters out there that are, you know, getting involved in gangs or growing up in the hood, you got to really think about that, man. You know, is this lifestyle really for you? Is this what you really want? And I tell everyone, you know, I'm not for actives, inactives or whatnot, man. I would much rather people change and make better choices and decisions because I think still as a whole that there could be choices and decisions that could be more lucrative overall for everybody if it's put into legitimate resources and businesses, man. That's the way I think people should start helping the gente because this stuff's been going on for years, no matter what. So there's always going to be indictments. As long as there's illicit activities, there's always going to be indictments. Now, I thought it was kind of interesting about the Mongols up in here that they had to pay 100K. I heard about that as well. Um, you know, this was a big indictment. You know, uh, I don't know what they're going to do with this attorney. Um, it always seems like when an attorney gets indicted, man, they always get the most love or correction officers, man. And, you know, I think that's unfortunate, man, because, you know, I think if you're put in a position of authority or power, I think you should suffer more repercussions than a regular person. It's just like, you know, when some people commit certain crimes, that gang enhancement adds time. That should also go for law enforcement, cops, judges, or whatnot, man. You know, I don't think a person's, you know, position warrants them to be treated any different than anybody else, man. And that's just my truth of it, man. That's just the way I look at things. Everybody's going to look at things a little bit different, man. You know, um, anyways, man, this is a real quick spill. You know, I think it's... uh. Things like this are going to scare certain attorneys from making those choices, man. But there's always been certain attorneys, even law enforcement, man, that can be, you know, with the right mouthpiece and the right thing you're offering. Have no problem bending the rules if it cares to them. And that's just the reality of it, man. That's just the, the greed of mankind, you know what I'm saying? That people will take those risks knowing that they could be looking at time. And then when they get caught up, they want to complain and cry, oh, you know what I mean? You knew what you was doing. You know what I'm saying? More so as an attorney, you knew what you was doing. You knew the risk you were putting yourself in. Um, you know, and I don't think there's no... Uh, <laughs> that's what I said. When you start to involve yourself with too many people communicating, you never know which one's going to flip. And that one person flipping could have a domino effect on others, man. Anyways, man, I hope everybody has a positive day, man. This is a real quick spill. i seen this article, man. I wanted to break it down a little bit, man. And I did a little bit of research. Um, you know, this is a, this was a crazy case, man. You know, a lot of stuff going on in that LA County jail, man. Anyways, I'm out.